Hi everybody, welcome to the July 19th, 2019 edition of Colorado Inside Out. I'm your host, Dominic Gazzuti. Thank you very much for joining us. Let's get a quick take on Senator Cory Gardner initially declining to make a comment about President Trump's tweets this week, then later saying on a radio show that he would not have sent those tweets. Patty Cahoon from Westward, uh, Cory Gardner is getting used to walking this tightrope regarding any controversy from President Trump. Uh, was this just another day at the circus for him? Well, he'd better get a little better on walking this tightrope because saying he wouldn't have sent those tweets is kind of like, yeah, I wouldn't have killed your mother. I mean, how hard <laughs> is it to say I wouldn't have sent those tweets? The harder, the t more tricky thing is for him to say our president should not be sending those tweets. <laughs> David Copel from the Independence Institute and DU Law School. Uh, does this become a litmus test for other Colorado Republicans like Cory Gardner? Hard, hard to say, but here, here is my comment that Donald and the mean girls are all bigoted, childish, ignorant, vulgar narcissists. And their mutual interest in their play fights on Twitter and cable television is to distract the public from reality and suck the public attention into the vortex of their asininity. Definitely not Fetch. Speaking of Fetch, Ed C. Lever from Denver <laughs> Business Journal joins us. Uh, Ed, what do you think is, uh, does this controversy have any sticking power here in Colorado? I, I realize that it's been feeding the national news circuit for a long time. Does it have any sticking power here? Look, I realize that people want to get Cory Gardner's reaction every time Donald Trump says something stupid. Um, I actually think Gardner's reaction should have been to not comment at all. Because let's face it, I mean, when, when Trump puts these tweets out, he wants you to talk about them. He wants to, as David said, distract from the issues out there. And when Democrats continue to harass Cory Gardner about every one of Trump's tweets, all they're doing is playing into the president's hand. Frankly, if I were Gardner, I would have said, that tweet doesn't rise to the level of my making a comment on it and move on to something substantial like, I don't know, moving the BLM headquarters to Colorado. <laughs> Uh, uh, Megan Schrader from the, Denver, from the Denver Post, the editorial page editor, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Megan, do you think Democrats will make uh, more hay of this, seeing that Cory Garner has a litany of people who are running against him, or does this just draw more attention to somebody, that, as Ed was pointing out, that enjoys it? So it is a dilemma. Um, Democrats have set this up for years, crying wolf that Republican candidates are racist and bigots. And now that we actually have someone who is racist in the White House, I think his tweets showed that. I think his inability to respond appropriately to the chance at his um, rally show that he is racist and playing to, to promote those voters to vote for him. Um, are, are there cries calling on, on deaf ears? No matter how poorly the Democrats have, have handled things leading up to this point, I think at this point Republicans should step up and say, this one does require a specific response, and we should say that this is wrong, because it's wrong. Mayor Hancock of the Denver City Council were sworn in this week at an outdoor event with warm temperatures and even hotter tempers. Mayor Hancock laid out his plans for his third and final term in a speech that protesters attempted to shout over at times. Among Hancock's stated priorities were using the state's new process to consider raising Denver's minimum wage and a renewed dedication of more bike lanes in Denver. Patty, did you see anything new or at least a, a, a different plan that was different from the last eight years from Mayor Hancock in his inaugural speech? Well, yes, because now that he's finally a lame duck, we have the geese protests, which added something new. The rest of it wasn't new. It's the same themes we've heard both from the, the mayor and from people around this city. The homelessness issue is still huge. We were promised when the anti, by the anti-300 uh, campaign that Denver can do better. We have yet to see any evidence that Denver can do better, and that is going to be the hot topic of the next several years. Uh, minimum wage is still going to, is going to be an issue. Bike lanes, scooter lanes. I mean, we have a lot of things on our plate, but I think the rising rent and the, the unaffordability of this town and the homelessness issues remain the top topics. David, uh, you and I agree on an important issue brought up by uh, Mayor Hancock, which is bike lanes. And I think both, I, both you and I feel that more bike lanes in Denver, especially a town that at least sees a significant amount of snow a decent part of the year, is silly with as many cars as we have. Um, 
Do you see any roadblocks to that or anything else that the mayor proposed, seeing that there are five new faces in the city council, but it is a strong mayor style of government? Um, no, no, no roadblocks to bike lanes. It's, you're, you've got it backwards. The purpose of bike lanes is to block traffic. Uh, Hancock is the most anti-commuter, anti-traffic mayor we've ever had. The only guy ever as mayor has actually tried to cause traffic jams. So saying he's got a renewed dedication to bike lanes, that's like John Caldera renewing his commitment to pasta. You know, you're really strong enough on it to begin with. You, you don't need to, to amp it up even more. And, but he's also got an innovative solution to overcrowding and the, uh, the housing crunch in Denver is raising the local minimum wage will benefit some workers, but harm many more by destroying jobs. And so when those people don't have jobs anymore, then they'll have to leave, and that'll reduce the supply and demand pressures on housing. <laughs> uh, Ed, you were there. This is uh, your story that we used to build this topic. Uh, what do we need to know about what happened at the inaugural speech? Well, I'll tell you what surprised me. Ever since uh, Hancock was reelected, like, literally minutes after it was official, uh, he was using a line with the press saying, I've been told not to waste a third term. This is the chance to go out and do bold things, to, to keep in line with the voters, but maybe take steps that, that wouldn't go over quite as well in support of, of your vision that the voters just backed. I was really surprised to see how lacking in boldness this speech was. And and, I mean, you talk about, yes, his transportation was, let's do what we've been doing. His jobs pitch was, let's work more to create more women and more minority jobs, which we've been doing. Homelessness was, let's do it a little quicker. Uh, affordable housing, uh, we had this very big line saying, if the market won't correct itself, we will. And when I asked afterward about that, he said, oh, I just mean that we'll keep working on affordable housing credits and some of the things we've been doing. I think Hancock doesn't know what to expect going into this term. He lost a substantial portion of his allies on council, the people who would run through the wall, even if it cost them their jobs, and frankly, it may have cost Elvis Brooks and Mary Beth Sussman their jobs. Uh, and I think as he looks at the council, and he really can only count two hard and fast allies at this point, in my opinion, and Christopher Hernan and Kendra Black, maybe Jolan Clark on a number of things, um, I think he's unsure. And so this speech seemed to be like, I want to keep going. And it, and it did seem to create almost a status quo, but also in a way that said, I want to keep going. Is that OK with everyone? Um, I think the next six months are going to tell how much of his agenda, his boldness, he can really get done. Megan, what do you think we learned about Mayor Hancock's third term from this first speech? I think he's going to uh, stay the path. I think that one thing that we did learn, though, is that he did hear from voters that they are dissatisfied with development in the city. And he had a line in there specifically saying that um, he thought the, the neighborhoods should have more say in what development looks like in their neighborhoods and that they're they're going to um, address this more. I think that's a good thing. I think that voters, when they kicked out incumbent city council members, when they sent Hancock to a runoff election, were saying, I don't like what's happening in my neighborhood. It's encroaching on my quality of life and we, we've got to do something different. And I think Hancock signaled that he's going to hopefully be more proactive in that. And that's difficult because his backers are by and large developers who are doing the encroaching. So hopefully we'll see a mayor this term who really stands up to that development and says, no, you're not going to develop City Park. We have a conservation, or sorry, not City Park, um, Park Hill Golf Course. We have a conservation easement on it. No, you can't build a duplex there. That is not in the character of that neighborhood. Hopefully that's the Hancock we see this term. The city of Aurora is seeking help finding the six individuals that were involved in desecrating an American flag at the Aurora ICE detention facility last week. Immigration advocates said the works of these, those six people distracted from the message of unity and peaceful action that the estimated 2,000 other protesters were trying to bring. Uh, David, this certainly isn't the first time that a small group uh, stains the effort of a larger group, uh, regardless of the topic of protesting. But what do you think of the larger effect of this incident will be in Denver? Well, there are four countries which made claims to Colorado territory before Colorado became part of the United States. The French Empire, the Spanish Empire, the United States of Mexico, and then the Republic of Texas. And the raising of a flag is a indication of who you think is the proper sovereign, in this case the 
Mexico. Um, that is a view that is known as the, the Reconquista of the American Southwest, taking its name from the original Reconquista when the Christian uh, kingdoms of Spain pushed the Muslim kingdoms uh, out of Iberia. And the, this group in Aurora is hardly the first pro-illegal alien protesters uh, who have raised Mexican flags um, and advocated for Reconquista. Ed, we have a uh, uh, desecration of American flag, we have government property, we have free speech. There's a lot of issues here. Take your pick. You, you know, first of all, I, I, I'm going to go a slightly different direction. I want to give a shout out to the Aurora Chamber of Commerce, which has come under pressure to boot a representative of this private detention facility off their board. Uh, I'm glad that they are not giving in to that pressure uh, and letting people's opinions be heard all across the spectrum. That said, it's it's hard to know exactly where to go here. I mean, people are raising a flag over a detention facility, signaling the country that the people in the detention facility were trying to escape out of. So I, I don't know what, what this means, um, other than, uh, like most of our topics uh, that we discuss now, there is a Growing lack of ins growing lack of civility in discussing this. I mean, maybe we we could be looking uh, more at we could be should be looking more at the treatment in the detention facility. But incidents like this aren't going to help that. It's just going to drive a wedge in people where they're not going to be willing to listen to the other side. Um, so I I don't know where this goes, but I don't think we're going to have a lot more uh, informed um, compromise coming from this because of this incident. Megan, did the uh, Denver Post editorial page take a stand on any part of this issue? We did. We, were, we were, came out critical of those protesters. We thought they took it too far. And this is a difficult subject, right? Because it, there is a long history of civil disobedience in America to push for changes when our government is doing something wrong. And, and I do think that our government has got to provide better housing for um, folks that we are detaining. Um, especially those who are seeking asylum. Those are not criminals. Those are people who are coming to our border looking for help. They are refugees in essence, saying, help us, and we are putting them in detention centers. The conditions have got to be on par, if not better, than refugee camps. And if they can't do it, they need to get the UN in here. If the GEO, group CEO, cannot provide better conditions for these individuals than uh, a refugee camp, we need to shut them down, have the UN come in and do it. Because that's what we're asking at this point, is safe, humane conditions for these individuals. That said, the protesters did take it too far. They violated a law that was unrelated to, to what they were protesting, right? They trespassed, they, they violated personal prop pro property. Um, so it's a difficult line to draw, but I, I think they went too far. Patty, does this become a bigger issue moving forward in Colorado? It's a bigger issue around the country. That's one of the problems. You had a protest where there were about 2,000 people, and for the most part, everyone was well behaved. They stayed on message. They're not just talking about the t detention facilities down on the border, which are horribly inadequate. But GEO has had some real significant issues with how they are running the facility in Aurora. It's going to be a big deal in the Aurora election. You've got some councils and some council members and some mayoral candidates who are really upset about what's going on with GEO. Although you're right, the Chamber of Commerce was right to let the person stay on. This has gone national though. The only thing you heard about this very, for the most part, well-behaved protest in Colorado, which was one of many protests around the country, is the flag. In fact, this morning on The View, to go completely shallow compared to David, this morning on The View, where John Hickenlooper was interviewed, they asked him, that's all they asked about the protest was the flag, and they showed the photos. Just days after the withdrawal of a petition to recall Colorado State Senator Brittany Pedersen due to an error on the initial recall statement, the Colorado Secretary of State's office approved a new petition this week, as well as one against Senator Pete Lee of Colorado Springs. Uh, Ed, I have often said that my life can be explained either by an SNL skit or a Warner Brothers cartoon, and in this case I have one. There's a Warner Brothers cartoon called Wide, Wide, Wild Wild World, where basically they, they do a Tex Avery style of they found a documentary from way back when the cavemen were living with dinosaurs. And you see how cavemen were living. And throughout the cartoon there's these group of cavemen hunters. They're going to decide they're going to hunt down a dinosaur. And they come up to a big dinosaur and they throw rocks at it and arrows and everything else, and the dinosaur brushes them away. And a few minutes later in the cartoon 
know, they come back and they go to another dinosaur and he stomps them and they go to another one. It feels like I am watching this cartoon over and over again by saying, here's another, we're going to recall this, uh, this politician. Yes, she won by 18 points and the recall efforts by the person that she beat by 16 or 17 points, but we're still going to try it. And then they're going to go off to the next person. I could be crazy, would not be the first time accused of so. What do you think about when you see yet two more recall efforts come out this week? Okay, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to step aside from the issue of whether or not recalls should even be used at this point, because I know my colleagues are going to talk about that. I want to go back to 2013, uh, when there were two successful recalls uh, of John Morris and Angel Harone. Uh, and what, what made them successful? Well, there was a, a hot-button issue that people did not expect those leaders to be voting on the way they did, and that was gun control. Uh, and they went into two districts that were either switched or Democratic leaning, but districts where they knew gun control, despite that status, was very unpopular in El Paso County and in Pueblo. Um, so that's what you have to look at here. What were the hot button issues that were going to make people pull someone out of office this year? Well, maybe it's the oil and gas regulations. Maybe it's sex ed regulations. I don't think so. I think oil and gas is probably the hottest one here. So what would you need? You need to go into a district where people are going to be unusually uh, pro-oil and gas despite electing a Democrat. They had that opportunity with Rochelle Galindo up in Greeley, and I think she would actually probably face a really tough test uh, maintaining that seat. But in the face of potential recall and a police investigation into her treatment of campaign staffers, she resigned. Now it feels like they are looking for other targets. I'm not sure Jefferson County is up in arms about oil and gas regulations because oil and gas development isn't going on in Jefferson County, and I don't think they feel the impact that other areas might uh, of these regulations. So I'm not sure that Brittany Pedersen is the best example here. Now maybe Pete Lee is the best example. Pete Lee actually holds the seat that John Morse was sitting in when he got thrown out of office. Um, but this is an interesting case too. Where Republicans should be careful on this one or the people behind it because Pete Lee is essentially the guy who killed the Paid Family and Leave Act this year by having too many questions on it uh, and is actually turned out to be uh, kind of a Republican ally or at least not an ally but someone who is willing to step in and question his own party on business issues and now they may be losing the goodwill they could have in crossing the, uh, the aisle with him by trying to go after him. So to answer your question in a very long way I'm not sure uh, why these two are being targeted. I'm not sure these are the best targets. Megan, how many of these efforts need to fail before it is no longer considered a strategic move? I think they're going to keep trying to do this until there's enough failure rate that they say it's not worth our time and not worth our effort. So people need to, to do their homework now so that when they're approached at the grocery store, they can decline to sign and do so knowledgeably right? That they're not caught off guard and they just signed the petition because, well, it sounds reasonable. If you're out here, they must have done something really bad. In fact, these individuals have not done anything nefarious or untoward that would warrant their recall in a traditional sense, that they have violated the trust of the public. You know, they, they took progressive Democratic votes on issues that they said during the election they would take progressive Democratic votes on. And so, I think that we we need to shut these down now before they make it to the ballot and send a record a message that recall should be used rarely. Patty, it seemed the among the reasons that basically you had to sum it up, it was this person should be recalled because they voted with fellow Democrats like a Democrat. I, I didn't see anything else there. Perhaps I'm missing something. What do you think? It was shocking, wasn't it, to, to see that they had done what they were expected to do. And of course, we also have the recall effort against Jared Polis, which calls for a lot more signatures, but we'll have people out talking about it. This is not, a, it, this is not 2013. It's, people are tired of this kind of fighting. I mean, you have enough time to just campaign for someone else for the next election. But right now, this is so counterproductive and these are the wrong two people to target. We'll see maybe in the next session, there could be some people who really go against what they promised during the campaign. But so far, these two aren't it. David, Rock Mountain Gun Owners is running the recall effort for uh, Senator Lee in Carter Springs. Is this less about a recall effort and more about raising money for Rock Mountain Gun Owners? Well, if you said Rocky Mountain Gun Owners, the answer to anything is always it's more about raising money. Um, I'd agree with that, that the, the Brittany Peterson recall seems completely hopeless. Lee may, may be a, a chance. I'm, I'm not so sure uh, about that. And I, I, I'd agree. This is, uh, I think it's a waste of time and energy on a bunch, by a bunch of activists that could be better spent uh, on pro projects with a higher 
possibility of success. CDOT has begun CDOT has begun its investigation into what caused the soil and concrete failure on US-36 this week. Because of the unique public-private partnership set up for the expansion of US-36, who is to blame and who is responsible for the cleanup is still in question. CDOT approved $20.4 million for the cleanup on this Thursday. Megan, uh, does this, is this going to bring a sharper eye to other public-private partnerships, just like the one that's going to be dug up in I-70 in the middle of town uh, that's happening as we speak? Absolutely. I think you look at what just happened with the US 36 project. You look at the debacle going on with the Great Hall Partners, P3 out at the airport, and their legal wrangle right now to find out how, who should be on hook for that money. Um, you look at RTD's problems with their public-private partnership. You know, that technology perhaps should have been abandoned a long time ago, but the P3 pushed forward with it, and now we've got a light rail system that is, has struggled to open. Um, the, this is uh, perhaps the nail in the coffin of public-private partnerships in this town. We are going to be so skeptical, I think, when these come forward. Now, it's possible that this US-36 was unavoidable, that it wasn't a construction defect, um, but I think you're going to see legal wranglings about who's financially responsible, even though that contract was sold as they are responsible for maintaining this road for the next... That, I think they're going to fight it and try and get CDOT to have to pay these millions of dollars. It's going to be ugly. I think that this will could be the end of public-private partnerships in Colorado. Patty, does this mess only get worse? Well, in the meantime, it's going to be a boon for any lawyers who deal with public-private partnerships. The only other beneficiary I can see, and I saw it a lot as I was driving back and forth on the back roads from Boulder this weekend, is the Rocky Flats Bar and Grill, which just reopened on Highway 93, <laughs> very conveniently when you've got 36 going down. David, what do you think? Uh, uh, legally, is this thing going to be as, mess, as messy as what the highway looks like right now? Uh, yes, and it'll, but the highway will be fixed in months, but the litigation will go on for years. But we, you got to give a lot of praise to CDOT for how well it, it, it's handled things. They got the, the lane adjustments done a day ahead of schedule so that they were working on Tuesday. And whatever else you say about remodeled 36, both directions are so wide with large shoulders that they, ne they have the room to have two well-functioning lanes going in each direction just using the, the westbound side of it. So that was, uh, the, the road design itself had a, a good backup uh, for what this construction defect appears to be. Ed, wrap it up for us. I'm going to have to disagree with Megan on the, uh, on the public private public-private partnership aspect, and that is because CDOT is essentially building its model around public-private partnerships now. If you're going to really build a front-range rail or a metro rail into the mountains, uh, as Jared Polis is really pushing to do, um, you're going to need private partners on this. So I think there will be a lot of investigation into this, but don't expect to see the state turn, uh, turn away from public-private partnerships just because a couple of these have not worked out. It's time for a very favorite part of the show, Disgrace of the Week. As always, Ms. Cahoon, please start us off. Well, you know, so as we sit doing this show, you can feel your email box filling up like the Titanic. But that doesn't mean you're not going to go look at those emails. The fact that Colorado managed to lose an email address that people were supposed to use to complain about the potential for child abuse for four years, no one checked it. They did switch addresses. There was an explanation, but not a good one. It was disgraceful. David. Ladies and gentlemen, college freshmen and other students, Ms. Patricia Calhoun is a female American journalist. She holds down the fort, battling against idiotic, stupid, and crazy behavior. And if you're starving, her paper's restaurant reviews make it a cakewalk to put yourself in a food coma. What I just said was 14 violations of Colorado State University's new speech guidelines. As Mr. George Orwell wrote, Waging war on the language of normal people is part of tyranny, which brings my CSU wrong speak count up to, 27, up to 17. <laughs> Ed. 
Uh, the um, Circle K Mexico, which put out a uh, ad for Secretary's Day this week, advertising a combo deal on chocolate, wine, and condoms. I stopped <laughs> counting how many ways I was offended after a little while. Uh, <laughs> somebody should think that may not be a good business plan. The producers of Mad Men probably think this still a little goes a little too far. Megan. Um, it was some late breaking news last night, but there is a scandal brewing at the U.S. Supreme Court, um, or sorry, the Colorado Supreme Court. Um, they had an administrator resign over um, a very questionable contract, $2.5 million contract that was awarded to an employee after she had been disciplined. And part of her resignation agreement was to wipe her record clean. It looks very bad. I think that uh, an independent investigation might need to be launched to find out why she was given this very lucrative contract. Great investigation by the Post. Time to say something nice about somebody. Patty? Slow Food Nations, which is in town this weekend. Great events all over. David? The anniversary of the moon landing. What a phenomenal accomplishment with so many people who worked so hard to make it happen. You're here. Ed. We've been talking about the need for rural economic development for so long we lose track of it. This week we see BLM moving to Grand Junction, and on a lesser scale, we see 98 jobs potentially going to Montrose and 171 to another rural area of the state coming through the Colorado Economic Development Commission. This is a good week to celebrate our rural areas. Megan. Uh, RTD gets a lot of negative um, press. I, I got to give them props. They implemented a low income rider fair. It's been long overdue um, and it's a very good thing. Before we go tonight, I want to let you know about a very cool programming marathon we have tomorrow. And David didn't even know about it, but it was a great segue. Uh, tomorrow, July 20th, we're commemorating the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. We're running all three episodes of the special American Experience series, Chasing the Moon, from 1 p.m. to 7 p.m. It includes some incredible footage and details of all the work and sacrifice that helped make the moon landing a reality. And that is indeed all the time we have for this episode of Colorado Inside Out. For everybody here at CPT 12, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you very much for watching. Good night.